Welcome. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about what it is that great improvisers know and understand, and specifically jazz improvisers, because they are kind of the masters of the masters of, of this particular aspect of improvising. And what that is, is chord tones, is knowing where chord tones are while you're improvising over certain harmonies, knowing where they are and being able to target them. So jazz musicians are especially proficient at this just because you have to be, because of the way of the nature of, of the the genre works and the and the texture and the sound and the language and harmonically what's happening in jazz is that um, harmony is moving around in such a way and modulating between keys in such a way where um, you have to rely on that um, to to even just be able to be playing something that fits appropriately. Um, you, you can get away without thinking of chord tones if you just know a scale and a piece of music doesn't modulate at all. So a lot of improvisers are, are doing that and it can sound great. I mean, like just ripping it on the blues scale is a great example of this, whether it's in a blues or just on a rock tune or a pop tune or something like that. Totally great example of this. But again, those the higher... Um, or I should say the more advanced um, improvisers, and, and I don't mean to say it, you can sound great without doing that, but but the more advanced in just having kind of more uh, the, the asset of knowing where those chord tones are and having more control, uh, you'll hear them even on pop tunes, simple songs, rock songs that don't modulate keys, really knowing where they are, uh, chord tone by chord tone, chord by chord, you know, specific notes that make up each chord and following that, targeting that. So um, so I want to do an example of, show you an example of what Wes Montgomery does in just the intro to his solo on the tune D Natural Blues. So this is a tune that Wes Montgomery uh, composed and recorded and just the very beginning of what he plays in his improvisation just shows us, wow, he knows exactly where he is, uh, knows what's going on in those chords, targeting those chord tones. Um, and almost, ex I mean, often you can say, wow, it's almost all chord tones. And then there's just a couple connecting notes here and there. So it's all about knowing chord tones. And and then using them musically, and using them musically is um, is the challenging part. You know, we can just all work on arpeggios forever, but then how do you use them musically? So we're gonna. That's why it's cool to look at a specific example. So, so uh, I'd like to talk about that uh, solo and just a little bit. And uh, the two chords are just gonna be D seven and G seven. Um, and I should say, you know, when we talk about chord tones, it, it's it's often this theory thing where we're mapping out uh, theoretical information and wanting to know where that those are. Even someone playing totally by ear, I'll, uh, people do this all the time. If you're kind of finding what sounds good to you or, or your mind is hearing something clearly and you're, you're able to follow it or whatever, uh, you're still intuitively doing the same thing. You're still kind of latching onto the quote unquote good notes or stable notes and kind of finding those and, and nailing those. So if you just like to sing along and improvise, harmonize with music or try to sing over something, um, you're kind of looking for those notes that sit well with it, and those are the chord tones. So here we want to kind of know arpeggio shapes on the guitar and then be able to use them musically and effectively and, and expand from there. So I'll talk about a couple ways to work on it, but also showing you this example. So uh, so if we play D7 and G7 in, in the blues, and this is a very slow blues, this uh, D natural blues, it's about... that chord change so here's G7 so we have a measure one two three four of D7 a measure of G7 dominant seven these are both dominant seventh chords um, cool so now in this position I'm gonna map out just my chord tones of each chord. So one, three, five, flat seven, one, three, five, flat seven, five, three, one, flat seven, five, three, one, flat seven, five, flat seven, one. The way I did that is the way I like to kind of review it or have people practice it. Start on the root, go all the way up, go down below the root, and then land back on that root. Uh, that is your uh, lowest root. There's also a root here, but it's 
a dominant 7 arpeggio shape. If we map out G in the same position and our root is here, we have 1, 3, 5, flat 7, 1, 3, 1, flat 7, 5, 3, 1, flat 7, 5, 3, 5, flat 7, 1. Okay, so let's jump into the example of Wes Montgomery's solo and then I'll talk about how you can work on practicing your own improvising with those two things to start to feel good about it. Because again, going from just working on mapping it out to playing with it is, is a pretty big leap. Um, so in his solo, it starts off like this. That's that first line. So melodic, so relaxed, so much control that he has there. It's it's just gorgeous. So this this first thing, da, 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 it's going one flat seven one flat seven one. Okay, chord tone, chord tone, chord tone, chord tone. Then it goes to the two, totally fine. Um, you know, there are obviously other scale notes and there's even chromatic notes that we can use, but still we're dancing around the chord tones, you know, and really if you know these chord tones well and then just dance around them, kind of play with even connecting them chromatically and don't even sweat keys or anything like that, you can start to find things, especially kind of following by ear a little bit, right? So if I knew that this is one and this is flat seven, I'm just kind of chromatically connecting between them, making sure if I pause, I'm kind of on a, again, quote unquote, good note, um, the stable note, the chord tone. Um, it's not really a better note or a good note, but it's like the note that's in uh, part of the essence of the chord. So we have one, seven, one, seven, one, two, one, seven, one, seven. So all ones and se sevens, and that's the flat seven, except it goes up to two for a sec, which is part of the scale. That's the money spot right there where it goes to landing on and if we know that G7 uh, shape the chord tones of it lands on the three so it goes one flat seven targets the three of G7 uh, that is an ideal resolution to to play the flat seven of D7 to the three of G7 where it goes next Okay, so now it goes three, one, five, six, flat seven. Again, it's all, this time it's all the chord tones of G7. One, I'm oh, sorry, three, one, five, flat seven. That's everything, that's all four notes. But there's a little connecting note here that's the six or the, the six of the scale or the 13. So three, one, five, six, flat seven. Da, 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 da. So tasty, so good. It's not just like, here's a bunch of scale notes. I learned my scale. It's like, no, this is. Um, and it's also not just like chord tone, chord tone, chord tone. It's, it's, it's phra phrasing it very nicely. Um, but let's piece it together again. So. Okay, so I'm gonna say it again with just the, the labels of them. And if you wanna practice this specifically, you know, in general, I'm more talking about the idea and, and just how powerful it is that this is what the master improvisers know so deeply uh, that they can just uh, play something that, that perfect over a chord and just targeting chord tones lyrically and expressively um, and most likely not thinking about it in that way even, but just because they've internalized it. So my main point is that and then how to practice a little bit, but if you wanna practice this, um, then think of it with these numbers, you know, as opposed to me giving you like, here's the tab, I want you to think of it. Um, so one, flat seven, one, flat seven, one, two, one, flat seven, one, flat seven, three, five, Three, one, five, six, flat seven, right? You can do that anywhere on the guitar or in any key. And if you're thinking of it in that way, then if you're if you're mapping it out by thinking of it that way, you're in, you're learning it much more deeply than if your hands just knew it for sure. Okay. So I, I just think that's so so tasty. Let's look at another example. Um, it's just a little bit later because he next goes. So there's a, a little thing that happens in the tune yeah, or next in the soul, that's his next phrase, but then it connects to this. 
so good. Um, so it's the same thing. We're going to analyze that little moment there. Okay, so we're on a D chord, and actually he's superimposing the idea of an of an A minor um, at going A minor or A minor seven or two to D seven or five two five resolve, right? So he's adding that chord to it. So knowing that, wow, we actually have um, flat three one five of A minor, just straight up and then moving a chromatic line into landing on the chord tone of D. So let's say this, let's say explicitly that it's A minor seven to D seven to G seven, because that's what he's playing over it. So we have flat three, one, five, passing tone, five, flat seven of A minor seven, five, three of D, Oh, that flat seven of A minor seven resolves to the three of D again. That's already happened once. Um, da, 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 flat seven, three, flat seven, three. It's gonna happen again, even in a second. So it's just happening all the time. That flat seven resolving to the three of the next chord. So we have, okay, love that. Now we're on D, three, five, one. I'm uh, sorry, three, five, flat seven, one. That's the whole arpeggio of D. That's what happens next. Three, five, flat seven, one. Then it goes to flat nine. Okay, so that's uh, kind of causing some tension there and also can be considered a chord tone. And then jumps to three, jumps to flat seven, jumps to one, chord tone, chord tone, chord tone, chord tone. All happening super quick. Just jumping in nice and relaxed, like here's my solo, all happening so quick. You know, you gotta know that stuff so well to get to that level, but it just shows like, wow, it really is the case. It really is the case that that we want to have those really mapped out and then lyrically dance around them. Uh, three, five, three, five, flat seven, one, flat nine, three, flat seven, one, resolve to the three of G. Okay, so I know this is a lot and I'm not having it, you know, written out for you or anything. Um, I just want to kind of talk about how exciting it is to, to look at that and just share with you, you know, my enthusiasm for um, how on point that that is. Um, and of course, if you transcribe anything or or pull up the Charlie Parker Omnibook and, and learn a, a lick or something and, and look at it in this way, you're going to get the same benefit. I'm, I'm advocating for that type of depth of analysis and starting to just think of um, wow how, how much we want to have it internalized in that way so uh let's do this one lick one more time okay a minor chord tone almost all chord tones except for this passing tone um it's like every time every time we have actually in all of these we've had all chord tones except for one passing tone chord tone chord tone like pure chord tones you could even say the nine is a chord tone or the flat nine is a chord tone um, you could make a case for that, but just the one, three, five, seven, one, seven, one, seven, one, two, one, seven, next chord, three, uh, one, five, passing tone six, flat seven, and then I skipped this other part because I want to just show you this other lick, and that's three, one, five, passing tone, five, flat seven, five, three, five, uh, next chord, three, five, flat seven, one, flat nine as this added thing, but then straight up three, flat seven, one. It's like almost exclusively chord tones. So those little added notes um, are powerful. It's a way to think of it too. If you're working on arpeggios and chord tones, think of how can I just add one little tasty connecting note to it? Okay, let's talk about an exercise for practicing your chord tones now. So let's just say on D7 and G7, I mean, it's gonna be kind of obvious what I'm gonna tell you to do, but the approach you know, mentally is, is that I want you to be really careful about not blaming your playing on the fact that you're only playing chord tones. I say that because a, a lot of people will work on chord tones, chord tones, chord tones, improvising with chord tones, and then feel like, but it's not the way I want it to sound because it's only chord tones. How do you do all the other stuff? Fine, you know, and I just talked about adding extra notes, adding passing tones, adding that one 
tasty note you can find, you know, maybe within the scale or something chromatic. But if we can't get ourselves to play something we feel good about with just the chord tones, the answer is not that we need more notes. The, we need to be able to play something with even just a couple notes. I mean, West Montgomery, da, 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 da. you know, three notes there, just nice, um, nice expressive phrase. Um, so we want to be have that be our challenge, right? Look at it that way. Don't think, oh, it's going to start sounding good once I add all the crazy stuff in the scales. I need more licks. I need that. Um, can you play something that you feel good about with just the chord tones only. It is limiting, but that is what good practice is. We want to set parameters and we want to stick to those parameters to enhance our ability and our overall control. So if you can improvise with just just over a D7 and feel good about it. Now that's pretty static, right? So you might feel like I want it to change and be jazz, but make sure you can improvise over just D7 or any any chord and then just G7 chord tones and, and or any other chord if you're doing a different progression. And then connecting them is this is that kind of leap that we have to get to and connecting them uh, as much as we can by step or with close voice leading and this obviously this flat seven to three of the next chord resolution is a very powerful thing to try to focus on. So if we can just uh, improvise over D7. So if I just make a little loop here, so okay. So I'm going to improvise with just the chord tones. So does it feel limiting? Yes, but not in a way where like, I don't like it, but more just like, yeah, I want, I'd, I'd like to add some other stuff, but I need to have the control of intentionally sticking, um, sticking on the path that I, that I chose. If your hands are just doing stuff because you always play the nine or you always play some lick or you always play something from the scale, um, that's, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. So I want to, you know, feel good about the phrasing or my tone or the feel and be able to play with just the chord tones. Okay, so if we do it on G7, delete this here, and then do G7. Okay. more about the phrasing. It's more about the phrasing, I think. Um, where you pause, where you land, how you make a statement and then react to that statement. Also, I'm doing a lot of kind of embellishing, you know, sliding up to things. If you, if you even feel good about that and then add some connecting notes, just deciding this is a note that's in between other notes or this is a note outside and I'm going into into a chord tone. Um, that's, a, that's a really great way to practice. Let's do that for a sec just to, to experiment with it. So just throwing in chromatic stuff there. Um, if I know there's the two notes that are a minor third apart, three, uh, three or four spanning four frets, I was connecting like that a lot of times. Um, and, or just kind of, I added a half step above the root and then, and then down, just kind of playing with that. So now though, let's talk about connecting the two together. Um, and this is where, so you got the idea now that you want to, if you can't play something you feel good about with just chord tones, then have that be your, your focus instead of adding something more, right? I can't emphasize that enough. If we can't play something we like with a limited set of notes, a limited set of rules and parameters that we can have control over, um, then how are we going to play something that we feel really good about when there's even more options? Right, so you should even be able to say, "Can I take two notes? Can I take one string and play something I feel good about?" Let's try that for a second. If I just take, 
um, only the second string. I need that to be an idea. Whatever. I mean, it's just two notes, but it's still a musical idea. You know what I wanted to, and the timing on that was the timing on that was not perfect on the loop. But um, that is kind of a simple idea like that with one note, two notes, three notes. Um, is really when we, when it gets more complex, we're just we're just expanding from that same essence, that same original kind of simple nugget of inspiration or or feeling, and then elaborating or embellishing on that, right? So a lot of the most complex or, or cool sounding licks, phrases, solos, um, you can boil down to saying, oh, look at the look at the core structure is just this very simple thing. And then there's, and there's embellishment notes, and there's another layer of embellishment notes, or whatever. Um, so having control over being simple and expressive is hugely important. Okay, let's try this with the two chords connecting. So um, Two ways to do this. One, do it out of time, where you're playing. Um, where you're playing. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do this, but do this. Uh, you could do eighth notes, but out of time. So you play eight notes: one and two and three and four and, and then you find your connecting note: one and two and three and four and, find your connecting note: one and two find the closest note possible to the next chord. So you're playing eighth notes, but out of time, which just means you're playing eight notes per measure and pausing, giving yourself this room to find where is my money note? Where is my connecting note to the next one? You do that enough, you'll start to feel like, oh, I can kind of do it at a pace. And then you can start to play around with it in time. And you combine that idea of the tasty, simple, simple phrasing with being ready to switch to the next chord as close as possible from wherever you are. Okay, now, is it better or worse to, to switch as close as possible as far as the musical result? No, definitely not. You can jump to something, you can do whatever you want, you can be an artist, but we wanna have that control, we wanna see the option, we, we need to see those options to have that full control and have the choice of later saying, nope, I'm not gonna do that voice leading money note, I'm gonna do this leap because no one's expecting it or whatever. So it's not a value judgment of, of really what's better or worse music, it's about musicianship, training, and control. So uh, let's go ahead and do a progression of the two chords um, at about that tempo. I'll do a little bass line for it, just something simple. So, hopefully, I got that locked in time. G7. That's between those two chords. So, here's that. So that's D7. I was just playing in versions of, of those chords. They're still just uh, going G7 for a measure, very slow measure. D7 for a measure. Two, three, four, G7 for a measure. Okay. So now I, I can play those two licks that Wes Montgomery did off this. Um, I'll wait for it to start over here. fits perfectly. Uh, here's that other lick. Now I gotta wait for it to start over again. Love it. Lands right on the three of G from the flat seven. Well, kind of. Flat seven, one, three. Lands right on the three of G the, on, in both licks. In both licks. Okay, so I guess I can talk while that's not on. So. Now I'm going to just play chord tones only. I'm not going to even ca care about, do I like it yet, but am I just accurately switching in time, okay? And um, then, and just, am I seeing all the notes? Am I seeing all the options? Then you can start thinking about the phrasing and the tone and the feel and, the, and how relaxed you are. But um, focusing on one thing at a time and don't sweat if it's the sound you want yet. It, focus on the control and the fitness of it in a, in the, and your musicianship. And then you can add in the artistic element later. So just going to play with chord tones only. Thank you. 
Okay, so I kind of got carried away there in wanting to work on some of the actual ideas that I that I wanted to execute there. Let me scale it back for a second, and then and then we'll be done with this because I made my points, and I'm uh, partly wanting to just inspire you to practice this in a certain way and and focus on the things that I think make the biggest difference when working towards. Um, jazz improvisation in this case and mapping out chord tones, but same kind of outlook and, and approach can work with whatever genre, um, step-by-step -step parameters and, and control. So I'm going to set a parameter now, whoops, I'm going to set a parameter now where I'm only allowed to play on one string. This is a fantastic way to get the view of the chords of the, the chord tone shapes and the arpeggio, uh, the arpeggio shapes as they're often called, um, get them down and see them as they're moving, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and use the third string. And that's all I'm allowed to use. It's very, very limited, okay? So I really have to see now flat 7 1, flat 7 1, flat 7 1, 3, 5, 5 of G. So if you if you get good at that and let it be like, well, this is kind of annoying, I ran out of ideas, but that's okay. If you see it really clearly, move on to adding two strings. Okay, so I'm gonna add these middle two strings and then have to play between the two chords. Okay, so I kind of like that I got into a rhythmic motif there later to to sustain playing and, and keeping myself interested in it without just like saying, oh, well, I guess I played everything I can with these notes now, right? So the rhythmic um, idea can really extend uh, the conversation, if you will. So what this brings up is if your hands just automatically do things, this will highlight if that's happening or not because you're gonna you're setting rules and then if you break those rules because you're just like oh i just always play this thing and it goes outside of those two strings or just the chord tones or whatever you decided that shows that we have this autopilot flock this this you know some this thing that we want to correct and, and fix um in our playing we want to be able to uh work with just the parameters that we set in the end when you just play you can just play and those autopilot things are okay when especially if you like the way they sound and you want to use them but for the for more practice for better control for more room for more ideas for being ready on the fly for things um i this is very very effective and you can see how your practicing could really last a while you can do so much with it you could do other sets of two strings, you could do three strings, you could do other positions, you can do other keys. So um, it really eliminates this problem of like, okay, well, how do I get better at this? Or what do I practice next? You, you just start to work on, here's my new rule set, here's my new rule set. So anyway, I'll talk more about that kind of practice strategy stuff for sure in the future. But that's, that's it for this particular thing. And chord tone improvisation, knowing your chord tones well, jazz improvisation, looking at what Wes Montgomery was doing at the beginning of his solo there. Um, but that's it for this lesson. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, let me know if if you already are playing with chord tones and, and uh, if you found this helpful and if maybe try one of these exercises, see if it helps you kind of break out of that feeling that we've all had, that everybody gets to where you're just like, this feels, I'm doing the exercise, but it doesn't feel musical yet. So let me know what you think anytime. Um, Hope to see you in another lesson in the future and happy practicing.